Hello dear friends, once again a very warm welcome to Lit E-City, a channel which serves different needs related with English literature, theory, writers, works. Uh, we try to discuss all these things uh, as per requirement, especially of the net students. In this regard, today uh, we will start a discussion on some prominent postmodern writers. Uh, my friends, you know very well, postmodernism is basically a consequence of various political and social, economical, cultural events uh, during 1960s and later decades uh, that changed the, we can say, uh, expectation and the environment and the environment and all those things which defined what a literature is. Uh, the genre which was most used to define uh, postmodern element is that of novel. There were a lot of experiment experiments and some uh, novels were basically considered to be uh, the most important texts of postmodernism uh, theories. In this particular lecture, we are going to cover three such writers who are considered to uh, carry the bastion of postmodernism uh, into uh, the popularity. These three writers include Thomas Pynchon, uh, Kathy Aker and Paul Auster. So let's start discussing their important and selected works. The first writer which we are going to discuss is Thomas Pynchon, who was born in 1937 in America. Uh, a very interesting fact about Thomas Pynchon is that uh, he is a very, we can say, introvert, or introvert kind of person and there are uh, very few photographs or other biographical information available uh, regarding him. And he is known for his uh, subtle use of dark humor, absurdist element. Uh, we all know that even in modernist uh, period we have absurdist drama but um, the whole absurdist movement which was later developed into other postmodernist techniques also. Uh, he, uh, make, uh, he also make use of extensive technical language and scientific metaphors in his works and main theme, themes of most of his novels has been alienation of humanity in a highly industrialized world. If we talk about his important work, the very first work uh, which come to our mind is We. The, yes, this is the title of the novel uh, by Thomas Pynchon, We, and especially We with a colon sign. In fact, he himself uh, made it clear that it is We with a colon. It was published in 1963 and it is his first novel which recounts, which is about two protagonists. One is Banny Profane and the other one is Herbert Stencil and they both are searching for a particular mysterious uh, woman, we. We do not have the exact identity of this woman uh, and she appears in the course of novel in various guises at crucial moments in the history of late 19th and early 20th century Europe. Benny Profane is actually a former Navy man and he has, uh, he has forsaken his post. Now he wanders purposelessly the streets of New York, then he uh, visits Norfolk and in the end he goes to Malta with Herbert Stencil. Herbert Stencil on the other hand is son of Sidney Stencil. Sidney Stencil was a British spy and he mysteriously lost his life near Malta in 1919. Now Herbert spends his life obsessively pursuing a mysterious we. Now why he is pursuing this woman? Because he found a reference of her in one of uh, diaries by his father, uh, uh, his father's uh, secretly kept journal and he wants to know more and more about this woman. After searching in the sewers of New York, reading his father's diaries and interviewing people about V, finally he reaches Malta and he is about to disclose uh, the mystery around this woman, but he avoids the possibility of actually succeeding in his quest. This is very important. You know, you know 
uh, modern and post modern the difference between modern and post modern uh, literature is uh, one of these differences that there is no end to the quest modern literature is also about the futile quest but post modern uh, literature shows even the quest no, not only the result but the quest itself is futile because to do so would end the search and leave him susceptible to the process of entropy now dear friends this is very important term in the whole array of uh, thomas pynchon he is in fact he has written a, a short story which is also very popular uh, with the title entropy what is entropy entropy is basically a scientific term and with it means a kind of uh, disintegration a kind of declining a kind of loosening up of ends so uh, this world this uh, the whole postmodern world it is in a state of entropy which we will see in uh, many works of uh, thomas pynchon if we talk about uh, this mysterious woman v she appears in various guises at various places around the world generally at a moment of crisis and upheaval uh, some of her appearances uh, in the novel which we come to know from uh, uh, sydney stencil's narrative uh, she appears as victoria rand during the last victorian Uh, years then vera merowing then veronica and uh, 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 last uh, the bad priest so these are various guises various forms in which she appears in the novel actually she is a symbol for a dying society personifying the forces that have sapped modern human kinds vitality so she represents this particular post modern condition this uh, we can say a uh, completely weakening of uh, human uh, power or prowess or we can say finally realizing that modernization modernizing process was a futile project If we talk about the second very popular work by Thomas Pynchon the crying of lot 49 49 dear students it was published in 1966 and uh, many times uh, questions have been asked related with this particular work because it is one of the uh, representative work of post modernism This famous novel is about a women's quest to discover the mysterious and conspirational Tristaro system you can once again see the similar pattern in these two novels once again this novel also uh, b- f- follow the motive motive of search or quest in a futuristic world of closed societies edipa mas uh, the name of the protagonist she is a california based bored housewife she is informed that she is the executor of her former lover peers in verities estate she comes to know about through a post during the process she uncovers a vast underground conspiracy with ancient origins uh, actually uh, in a typical post modern fashion, uh, fashion there is mingling of both fact and fiction it is one of a highlighted feature of post modern that you cannot uh, find where the fact ends and fiction begins or where fiction ends and fact begins they both are intermingled with each other quite closely uh, so there is an illegal communication system whose origins go back to the middle ages when thorn and texas now coming to the factual side of this novel this company actually existed during this period a private european postal service which gained monopoly on the main delivery mail delivery in europe there was also a rival group tristero which attempted to take business away from turn and texas now during her search edipa encounters many strange people including a crazy scientist who is trying to prove the existence of a puzzle in physics called maxwell's demon named for the famous british physicist clark maxwell 
her increasingly deranged her husband Muko and a conference of deaf people who dance in perfect rhythm to music which they can't hear. So these are the people which you encounter and learn uh, many things about uh, this particular underground society. At the end of the novel she is waiting for the opening of a stamp auction. In fact the very title The Crying of Lot 49 it refers to the opening of bidding for one or group of items at an auction. Uh, which may reveal the meaning of Tristero. So once again we can see it is an unfinished quest which Pynchon has highlighted in this very popular novel. Next novel which is considered to be the classic of postmodern fiction, a, a sort of we can say dystopian novel. I hope you all know what a dystopian novel is, a novel which represents a, 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 a devastated society, a society which is in fragment and which is literally opposite of a utopian uh, society. It is set in, in, in an area of post World War II Germany and the area is known as the June. The novel centers on the search of a secret V2 rocket. Once again uh, the motive of search is there. Now its component and especially an advanced form of plastic which is termed as Imipolex G. Now this rocket is developed by the Germans during the war period and it was used by them and it is the first rocket designed to carry a human being into space. So uh, basically it is an invention uh, to cross the gravitational pull of earth. So it is we can say a very uh, important advancement in human technology and development. The British, the Americans and the Russians, they all are rivals in trying to find prototype of another such rocket A4 which is a further advanced model of V2 which is more fatal, which is more futuristic so that they can gain an advantage in the post war world. Now, Coming to the characters, there is a British behavioral scientist, Nat Pointsman, who is a firm believer in the Pavlovian, uh, named after Russian uh, behaviorist Pavlov. Uh, his idea was that people like all other animals act in response to stimuli and uh, with a proper uh, mechanism we can control the responses, uh, the reflexes of a human being. He sets, Ned Pointsman sets an American lieutenant Tyron Slothrop on the track of the V2 rocket. As a child, in fact, Slothrop was the subject of experiments conducted by a Harvard professor who is, a now, who is now a Nazi rocket scientist. In fact, it is the same professor who developed this V2 rocket. So, uh, Ned Pointsman is of the view that there must be some link between Tyron and this Harvard prof uh, professor. Now during his search, Slothrop is caught up in a great power struggles that involves a mysterious Captain Blisro, uh, who is a German officer and the manager of the project to create the A4 rocket. There is also an African tribe, Herero, who have been trained as German rocket technicians and the tribe's leader think that this rocket will basically brought them salvation. Major Maui, he belongs to the US Army Ordnance and a black, uh, a black marketeer named Schnorp and Roser Mexico. He is a British mathematician who counteracts the behaviorism of Ned Pointsman and he is even willing to take risks with his own life to save life of Slothrope. The narrative is filled with description of obsessive and paranoid fantasies which is a regular feature of Pynchon's novel, ridiculous and grotesque imagery which is once again a representative feature of all postmodern novels and esoteric mathematical and scientific language. So that's how this novel is designed. Another very popular work by Thomas Pynchon is Mason and Dixon. Now Mason and Dixon it is set in 18th century and uh, Pynchon based the novel on an important event in American history that is Mason-Dixon line. 
it forms the boundaries of Pennsylvania and Maryland and thus it divides North and South America. It is narrated by Reverend Wicks Cherrycock who stays at his sister home and his duty is to entertain his two nephews Pliny and Pitt. For this purpose he recounts the adventure of Mason and Dixon. They were the surveyors who created this line dividing Pennsylvania from uh, Delaware and Maryland. However, though, though he personally uh, knew them, but he didn't have all the information regarding their exploits and work. So with the factual information, he mixes many interesting anecdotes of his own to create a half mythical, half factual picture of early America. Okay, dear friends, uh, you can subscribe to this channel Lit E City, which is designed for all literary purposes. You can find works related with literary theory and terms, many to, related with cultural studies. There are also many MCQs based videos on cultural studies, and at the same time, we have videos on major writers and selected works. Okay, going to our next work that is. Uh, but next writer Kathy Aker, born in 1948 and died in 1997. She is an American novelist and known for her iconoclastic lifestyle. Uh, she is known for interrupting the narrative with an anti-capitalist and anti-patriarchal passages and self-reflexive commentaries. She frequently uses postmodern techniques. Uh, some of these techniques include combining text from pop culture and high art in a collage fashion, autobiographical content, introducing historical figure, figures and famous fictional characters, subverting chronology, uh, chronological linear chronology is not followed and using foul language and pornographic imagery. A very interesting aspect of her novels is uh, she is uh, sometimes blamed for plagiarism which she accepts that yes she uses a, a text uh, which we uh, in post modern and post colonial uh, uh, sense we use the term intertextuality. Intertext, uh, or let me write once again, textuality, taking help of another text to highlight or contradict or contrast or uh, even to uh, contribute one particular point. Uh, in her first novel, The Childlike Life of the Black Tarantula, the narrator claims that her intention is to become a murderess. Uh, you can find many fantastic elements interwoven with very real elements. So her novels verge on magic realis realism. We know very well that magic realism is one of the foremost feature of postmodern fiction. Uh, uh, she wants to repeat the words of the lives of other murderers. Aker mixes entries from her own diary with accounts from the lives of murderesses and other historical and fictional figures, giving them all the position of first person narrator. This is important. All these come to the pages and speak their, about their lives. And so it's a very unique or we can say a very experimenting kind of novel which rejects all the traditional aspects of novel writing. In the very next work, The Adult Life of Toulouse Lautrec, uh, which is based on the French Impressionist painter Henry Toulouse Lautrec, but this painter is transformed into a deformed woman and who craves sex but is uh, he's not she is not able to get it because she is ugly and deformed to lose together with her friend the painter Vincent van Gogh he becomes involved in a murder scene and then the Agatha Christie's detective Hercule Poirot, he attempts to solve the murder of a young girl. So you can see mixing of genres, bringing of characters from other writers' works, 
and historical real characters and then uh, basically uh, making a text creating a text similarly on almost on the same lines we have great expectations published in 1983 which begins with a section called plagiarism so even she admits that it is a sort of plagiarism not only in the title in addition to the novel by dickens of the same name aker also borrows from john keats poetry pornographic novel the story of o virginia woolf's orlando and marcel proust's remembrance of the things past she takes material from all these texts the novel begins with the introductory sentences from dickens great expectations but aker alters the protagonist's name from pip to peter and most importantly she presents another protagonist in the story and this one is a female next important work by her is blood and guts in high school published in 1984 which recounts the adventures of janie smith a 10 year old girl who is having an affair with her father johnny so it's uh, on the lines of incest and rape aker includes passages of cultural and political commentary mainly critiques of capitalism and interjects self reflexive statements so it's a very uh, good example of meta fiction meta fiction is a crucial term in postmodern literature meta fiction meta fiction is a fiction about fiction the technique is revealed the fiction is pointed out as a fiction not a representation of reality another very popular work by aker is don quixote which was a dream this is the subtitle now it begins with a women's preparation for an abortion and her decision to take on a quest so first thing is uh, from the male uh, we can say uh, quester we have a female quester unlike the straight forward quest in cervantes novel the female quixote quest is cyclical and is continually disrupted by counter narratives this is important feature once again a very important feature of post modern literature fragmentation of narrative what an a particular point is a point of view is presented but a counter point of view is uh, at the same time or we can say collaterally presented so that the reader is basically not able to define uh, to whom he or she believe uh, aker's quixote dies at the end of the first section yet she is once more alive at the beginning of the final section she dies again in the final section but is still able to write so it's a kind of a cyclical nature which aker points out in this particular novel now we come to her two most important works the first is empire of the senseless published in 1988 which alternates between the experiences of its two first person narrator one of whom is a female and her name is abho which is quite uh, we can say uh, indicative and symbolical of her character she is a part robot and part black so two marginalized thing one we can say uh, this work uh, includes what we later come to know as a typical branch of science fiction robotics so this is also there and also uh, black because she is black so both marginalized uh, entities are used in this character of abhor and the other uh, who is a male named thivai he uh, thivai is a psychotic drug addict and he needs a particular enzyme to survive these two character live in a disease ridden and dilapidated paris which is set in near future the story begins with thivai retelling the story of abhor's childhood and how she was molested once again there are many autobiographical element in the story then thivai talks about himself and how he came to be dream of becoming a pirate the main plot takes place in paris which is under algerian revolutionist occupation in a fictional future once again it is a kind of scientific dystopia uh, which aker has created 
In Memoriam to Identity, published in 1990, is one of the most celebrated works of postmodernism fiction and most popular work by Aker. It combines three cycles of narrative. First, it is an anachronistic. Anachronistic means which does not follow the true chronology of events, which which basically have jumps in the time. It is an anachronistic reconstruction of Rambaud, uh, who was a famous French poet. He was from the early symbolist poets. He was a French poet, Rambaud. Uh, it is an anachronistic, that, so that though he belonged to the end of 19th century, there are many references to the 20th century and also to the 18th century related with Rambaud with deliberate mistranslation of Rambaud's words. Uh, the major focus of this particular section of narrative is Rambaud's impatient relationship to Verlaine, a kind of homosexual relationship between these two great poets. Verlaine was also his senior and uh, we can call uh, the first French poet to use symbolism extensively in the poetry, who is compelled to choose between a socially unacceptable uh, uh, liaison with the boy and his responsibility as a father and husband. The second narrative line is about airplane who is a young girl and absolutely depends on a rapist. So it's a once again a kind of quizzical uh, relationship between the uh, victim and the uh, rapist. Uh, it mirrors in a sort of Rambaud's relationship to Verlaine. There is also a transformative replication of Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury. Uh, William Faulkner, the very famous modern American writer and his work The Sound and the Fury and it concerned the sexually voracious capital. She is erotically obsessed with her brother Quintin because capital can never remember any of the men with whom she couples. She not only erases these men as individual human beings but alighting all memory she effectively destroys herself. So it's a philosophical come mystery come uh, the intertextual work and so uh, particularly a Kathy Ecker has created a very jumbling confusing narrative in which people from one time and place uh, encounter people from other time and place at the same junction. The last writer which we are going to discuss in this video is Paul Auster, born in 1947. He is an American novelist and also film director. He is known for his complex novels and reworking of the mystery genre. The main postmodern feature of his work is the search of identity in a fragmented world. Most of them uh, you can understand most of the works by postmodern writers follow some uh, common features the search of identity, the meaning of existence, the I, these are some of the uh, questions which these postmodern texts raise. Uh, he is famous, though Paul Luster has done very uh, some very popular works, he is also writer and director of Inherent Vice which is very popular uh, Hollywood movie, but he is best known for his The New York Trilogy. The first novel of this trilogy is City of Glass, published in 1985, which is the story of Quinn. He is a mystery writer, but he is not very popular and he is struggling and he receives by mistakes a phone call for Paul Oster, a detective, uh, an ironical subversion. Paul Oster himself presents as a detective in the novel. Quinn decides to be Paul Oster because he is actually a mystery writer himself and takes the case of Peter and Virginia Stillman and uh, the case is about Peter's father who they think is going to try and kill Peter. As a child Stillman, uh, Peter Stillman was a subject of cruel experiment by his father when he was locked up in a room for 9 years uh, and now his father is being released from prison. He wants Quinn to watch him and ensure he doesn't come back for him. Now Quinn follows Stillman Senior around the city. At first it seems his wanderings are random, but his journey later reveals that he was uh, moving into the streets to make the words 
Tower of Babel. We all are familiar with the Babylonian myth, uh, Babylon myth, where uh, we know how languages were fragment fragmented. Actually, language was one of the reason why Stillman locked up his son uh, so that he can learn the original language. Interested to know more, he becomes more and more interested. Quinn starts having conversation with him. Every time he presents himself uh, with a different name and uh, the senior uh, Peter never asks him any question, but he tells him about the meanings of words. One day Stillman disappears and Quinn is uh, not able to contact even Virginia. And uh, Quinn then visits the real detective Paul Oster to take advice or to take help. But Oster reveals that he is not a detective, but he is just a writer. Now Quinn's comebacks at his home, even at his home, uh, there is some strange women now living. He goes back and takes a, a house on rent opposite to the Stillman's house and he is waiting for Peter's father to come. For months, he lives on the street opposite to the house and keeps waiting for a still man. Naked, dirty, with nothing to eat, uh, he, he is almost uh, uh, on the verge of dying. Uh, but one day he wakes up and suddenly there is a food beside him. Besides him, he eats a little, writes something in his notebook and sleeps again. Now the story ends with Quinn himself becoming the subject of an experiment and another man, a writer, now looking for Quinn. You can now see, this is uh, what Oster himself has pointed out, that with philosophical jargon, you can write anything and reader will read. This is his own words. A cycle is going on continuously uh, as if whole project of uh, human development is phony, is futile. The next novel of this trial as he has ghost published in 1986. It is about a name, man named Blue. Blue is a detective and a student of a man named Brown. He is hired by a na man named White to watch over a man named Black. Watching Black is once again mind-numbingly boring because Black do, does nothing. He only reads, writes and broods. Blue, on the other hand, is a man of action. He begins to make up stories and fantasize about Black. Lekin soon he starts to struggle to separate fantasy from reality, which is once again an uh, important feature of postmodern literature. Losing all sense of his own identity, he fractures. Blue becomes black, but he soon realizes that black watches him too. While this chaos unfolds, both black and blue learns that white set them up and white is watching them both lo lose control. Once again, almost on the similar lines, who is watching? This is basically taken from the Lacanian concept of gaze, which is used by other uh, philosophers and theorists also. The last work of this trilogy is The Locked Room. The main character, he is the writer, he is contacted by a woman named Sophie, the wife of his childhood uh, friend, Fanshawe. Fanshawe has been missing for six months and he had wanted the writer to become the executor of his manuscript to see if it was suitable for publishing. The writer realizes the great merit of the manuscript and publishes it in his own name. He instantly gets popularity. Even he falls in love with Sophie. He goes on to marry Sophie and adopts Fanshawe's son. However, Fanshawe haunts their life and the writer decides only way to move on with their life is to find Fanshawe. This search, however, becomes an obsession for the writer, ending in a nervous breakdown in Paris. However, uh, after he recovers, uh, the real Fanshawe contacts the writer. But now the writer refuses to give up his newfound happiness with Fanshawe's wife and son. He doesn't want to speak to Fanshawe ever again because talking to Fanshawe means accepting that they are two separate people. Once again, the question of identity is deliberately presented by Paul Oster. Okay, dear friends, this was our session with some postmodern writers and their selected works. I hope these uh, proved to be helpful in your preparation for 
upcoming exams and I would suggest that please go and study uh, these writers and their biographical details also learn about uh, certain uh, I am trying to make a lesson on postmodern uh, techniques also so that it will help you to understand all this thing. Thank you dear friends for your support.